Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your night to come to this library program. Uh, this program is Geology of Central Oregon, the Crooked River Caldera. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore, and that's in Bend, Oregon. I don't know how many of you are from other places, but every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is place. So recently retired Forest Service geologist Carrie Gordon will be leading us on this geological history tour. Carrie Gordon is recently retired from being the forest geologist on the Ochico National Forest and Crooked River National Grassland for the U.S. Forest Service headquartered in Prineville, Oregon. Carrie received her BA in, ge in geology from what is now Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington, after working in Central Washington, Northern Arizona in the Oregon Central Coast Range for the Forest Service, Carrie moved to Central Oregon in 1992. She's a registered geologist in the states of Oregon and Washington. She's also an Oregon Master Naturalist through the OSU Extension Program. Carrie, thank you very much for telling the story of the landscape so that we can better understand our home and our world. <laughs> well, thank you, Laurel. Let me go ahead and, and share my screen. Hello, everyone. As Laurel said, we're gonna be exploring Central Oregon this evening. Well, actually the geology of the Pacific Northwest, we're gonna start by talking about the, the, uh, the four physiographic provinces that they're at the apex of. We're gonna talk a little bit about our geologic history to put it in context for the Wildcat Mountain Caldera and the Crooked River Calderas. One of the things that I like about exploring geology is we all live in unique different places. And wherever we are, we look around us and wonder about that landscape. How many of you have been driving along and you're looking out at those rocks going, what in the world are we looking at? It's kind of pretty landscape, but wow. Well, as you can see on the bottom, a geologist is looking at it in a slightly different fashion. We're looking at how the rocks are torqued and twisted or faulted or what's going on with that volcanic landscape. So we're looking at it in a slightly different way. I hope this evening that maybe you'll be looking at your landscape in a slightly different way. Geologists are kind of strange. We deal in time in a lot different time frame than most people. Think of the Empire State Building, 1,250 feet tall, equivalent to 4.5 billion years. There's a lot of geologic time, but we're literally only gonna talk about the last 60 million years, which is literally the top 15 feet of the Empire State Building. So there's a lot of geologic time that we're not gonna talk about this evening, but more likely where you live, you may have some of those really old rocks and be able to appreciate some of that deeper time. Another way to look at geologic time is with this timeline. We're looking at 4.5 billion years here on the far left where we're gonna pick up the story is right about here, about where the dinosaurs died out. We're gonna be talking about the Clarno volcanoes, the Crooked River caldera, talk a little bit about the Columbia River basalts all the way up through present day. <clears throat> so literally a lot of geologic time has gone on before we get to our story. Here in Central Oregon, we are so fortunate to live at the apex of four major physiographic provinces. Geology is the underpinnings for ecoregions, and some of you may be familiar with what ecoregions are. They're a way of looking at common soil, plants, animals, the geography, the climate, how it all fits together. But these are based on geology. And where we sit here in Central Oregon is we're at the apex of four major physiographic provinces. Yes, there is the high lava plains, but I look at the basin and range as being one of those major key players in our terrain. 
if you, for those of you that live here in Central Oregon, you know that when you take when you take a off on the highway, if you're headed to Burns, it starts looking totally different. And one of those reasons is you're headed into the basin and range country. That's where, from a tectonic standpoint, the North American plate is being pulled apart and you've got valleys dropping, ranges tipping up and erosion filling in and flattening out those valley bottoms. So it's desert country compared to darn near alpine when you get up to the top of like the Steens. If you drive north out of here, up Highway 97, it gets to looking flatter and flatter and flatter. Well, that's because the Columbia Plateau is underlain by pancake layers of flat basalt. We'll talk about those types of basalts here a little bit later. But it the terrain changes, the vegetation changes. When you're driving across that country in the spring, the lupin is in bloom. You've got sunflowers glowing across the landscape. Right now, it's bunch grass and sagebrush that you're seeing out there. If you head off to the northeast, you're going up into the Blue Mountains. It's changes dramatically as you go into the Ochoco Mountains and head on toward John Day and Sumter, you get into granitics and some of the older rocks. In fact, those granitics are the roots of volcanoes, but we're seeing them raised up. So you see a totally different mountain range, different types of rocks. And if you go due west, you get into the high Cascades and you're talking about younger volcanoes, basically those ice cream cones that have been getting dressed with, with all sorts of snow here lately. So it's, it's a total change wherever you go, leaving central Oregon. And the rocks tell those stories. Another part about geology is we need to understand the tectonic structure. 150 million years ago, our lovely coastline was at the edge of Idaho. We have had a lot of material that has been pasted up onto the North American plate over that time. So there's a lot of material that is accreted or added onto the North American plate as these the plate tectonics are going on. And what's happening is the, the Juan de Fuca plate is diving under the North American plate. And these big chunks that you see here, Celestia, Franciscan, Granitic intrusions, the Wallawa, these are all some of the accreted terrains that have been pasted onto the North American plate. But we can't see those very well because all of these younger volcanic rocks have basically covered them all up. And that's the fun part about our geology here in Oregon is finding those little pockets where those older rocks poke up and understanding the story that these volcanic rocks are telling us. Another way of looking at this terrain is we've talked a lot recently about subduction zone earthquakes. And those are happening off on the coast to the west of us where plates are being bound up. We're not gonna talk about earthquakes tonight. We're also not going to talk about necessarily crustal earthquakes or some of the rifting earthquakes that ha happen in the basin and range country. But we are going to talk about magma th that is melting at the tip of the subducting plate that's creating in those eruptions of the, the young cascades. And we're also going to talk about hot spots or mantle plumes. And these are distinct, discrete, hot, hot areas of magma that are coming up through the crust and causing major eruptions. One other part of the tectonic story literally has come about in the last 
15 to 20 years. Studies have been done that have been looking at using global positioning systems to actually trace the movement of the rocks. And as and those accreted trains are literally rotating in a clockwise fashion. And the bigger arrows mean there's, it's moving faster than as it gets up closer here to the Seattle area. If you, any of you have driven up 97 and you get to the gorge and you head on up toward Ellensburg and Yakima, as you're getting between actually starting in, in the gorge itself, you start seeing these rigid rocks are all folded and crumpled. And that's the evidence of this rotation that's going on. And we're pretty much in that central pivot area. Where you can see that is actually in the Ochico Mountains to the east of us here in the brittle basalts. They're all cracked and broken. You could see that if you look at orthophotos or go to Google Earth, you can actually see this tic-tac-toe board of where these brittle rocks are reflecting all of this cracking motion that's going on. So geologic history, 150 to 60 million years ago, we were warm tropical seas. We had ammonites, we had plesiosaurs, we had no land. We literally were ocean. Very nice place to be if you were a mollusk. Um, the rest of us, we'd be pretty much out of luck. So that kind of sets the stage for where we ended up in 2005 to 2007. Jason McClary and Mark Ferns with the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries were tasked with mapping the north half of the lower Crooked Basin here in Crick, Jefferson, Deschutes, and Wheeler counties. The reason they were mapping is because we were starting to have a problem finding good groundwater. And they were asked to do the geology maps ahead of the groundwater study. And boy, did they find some interesting features. No idea what they were gonna come up with, but boy, did they have a story to tell when they got done mapping. This is the geologic map of the north half of the lower Crooked Basin. In the process of doing the mapping, they found the Wildcat Mountain Caldera, 40 million year old caldera, and they found the Crooked River Caldera, which is 29 and a half million years old. Who knew? They knew when they walked into this area that they were gonna be looking at volcanic terrain. What they didn't know was the rest of the story. First, before we go much further though, we really need to talk about different types of volcanoes. We've got one type of volcano that is really steep-sided, fairly short in stature, very explosive eruptions. The rock that comes out of it literally looks like this. This is cinder. And if somebody there is saying, well, is that Pilot Butte? Is that Lava Butte? You're right, those are cinder cones. Those are the types of volcanoes that are very explosive when they erupt. We have another type of volcano that's called a shield volcano. They're very broad, low volcanoes. They are, they are comprised of very runny, fast moving layers of basalt. And we have one that's huge, that is a little bit south of South of Bend, south of Prineville, 618 square miles. If anybody's saying Newberry, you got it, Newberry Volcano. Yes, there are other types of volcanoes interior to the caldera, to the Newberry Caldera, but it is sitting on this huge shield volcano. We have another type of volcano here in, in Central Oregon called a stratovolcano or a 
or a composite cone. And they're made up of layers and layers and layers of rhyolite and tufts and andesites, basalt. These are just types of volcanic material, extrusive volcanic material. And they layer up to where you get these big, huge volcanoes, these big features. These types of volcanoes are all sitting above the horizon. You could look out across the horizon and go, well, that might be a shield volcano, or that looks like a cinder cone. Not a caldera. A caldera is a totally different type of feature. This is one where, as I've been looking at this cartoon, the magma is coming up beneath the Earth's surface. It gets to the point where everything collapses to the interior, basically like a souffle collapsing. It all collapses to the interior and outrushes this material called tuff. It's the volcanic outpouring that comes from these big caldera eruptions. And later, along the edges of these calderas, ooze up these rhyolite intrusions. And that's part of that evidence that Mark and Jason were looking at, is some of these intrusions that came up around the edge of these calderas. Where have we got calderas? We've got them clear around the whole globe. This is just a small short list that Jason put together of some of the, the calderas that are closer to us here in, in North America. If you look up toward the top, the size of these bubbles indicates the volume of tuff that came out of these eruptions. We have Yellowstone, Huckleberry Ridge tuff. That's only 2 million years old. I mean, this is, this is fairly recent in geologic time. We've got another tuff coming out of Yellowstone. Crooked River is, is fairly sizable. It had 450 cubic kilometers of material that came out of it. We've got the Wildcat Mountain Caldera, about 90 cubic kilometers. Tower Mountain is a cute little caldera that's off to the east of us here, closer, closer to uh, uh, Granite and Sumter country. And finally, we get down here. Here's Crater Lake. Crater Lake does have a caldera, as does Newberry. Little itty bitty bit of tough. But if you look at the age dates on these, they are really young in comparison. Thank heavens, they're not, not too big of eruption. But this gives a sense of the type of calderas that we have around us here in the, in North, on North America and around the globe. So what does this material look like that comes out of these volcanoes? Well, the material is an igneous rock that contains, basically it's the debris that's come, that's from this explosive eruption. So it's bedrock, it's tephra, it's volcanic ash. It's fairly soft material that looks fairly light colored. It's fairly lightweight compared to basalt. Sometimes it is even green and it might be red. And some of these are alteration materials, clays that have altered later on. When I first moved here to Central Oregon in 92, I pulled up the geology map. I wanted to know about this new area that I moved to. And I saw this pocket of limestone that was mapped right here in Smith Rock State Park. And I thought, wow, really? Come to find out after Jason and Mark finished their mapping that yes, there is limestone, but that limestone is telling us about those accreted terrains that are at depth below the eruptive area of the Crooked River caldera. So the tuff picked up chunks of the limestone and brought it up and it was embedded into these tufts that were part of the outpourings of the Crooked River caldera. Was it that we had limestone like you find in Arizona? No, this was something that was at depth down deep be below where, where this magma came up through. Those accreted terrains that I was talking about earlier. So moving forward in time,
geologists talk about groups of rocks and we call them formations. Think about them like a family and a family has members and Clarno formation has members of different types of rock that were deposited about the same time. And they were deposited between 44 and 39 million years ago. And we had a tropical climate. It was wonderful, it was warm. Can you imagine walking out your door here and picking a bunch of bananas or going down and harvesting coffee beans so you could make your own, roast your own coffee? That's the type of climate that we had here in Central Oregon. It was pretty nice. It was warm and very warm and tropical. And that was when the Wildcat Mountain Caldera erupted 40 million years ago. The Wildcat Mountain Caldera is located in this little pocket up a drainage called Mill Creek. The upper end of Mill Creek is the Wildcat Mountain Caldera. There's not a whole lot left of that caldera. You could see the feature, but most of what you actually see are the erosional remnants of the softer tuff has eroded away and you're left with these erosional features. And one of these is Steen's Pillar. Steen's Pillar is located down here at the south end of the Wildcat Mountain Caldera. And Twin Pillars is all the way up here at the top. So this is the Wildcat Mountain Caldera. If you've been out Highway 26, you've been along the eastern edge, eastern margin of the caldera. These are some of the intrusions, rhyolite intrusions. Twin Pillars is literally some vertical dikes, rhyolitic vertical dikes that are at the upper headwaters of, of Mill Creek. And we've got Forked Horn Butte, that's another rhyolite intrusion that came up in, inside the caldera. Geologists look at these calderas and they've, we've identified the fact that the erosional products, the materials that come out of the calderas weather the same. So how are you gonna tell these things apart? You got the Steen's Pillar Tuff, you've got the Tuff of Smith Rock. They are totally different in age. How do you tell them apart? And that's where geochemistry comes in. Think of it as the DNA of the rocks. You're talking about the geochemistry of the rocks. And when, they, when the tests were actually done, what turned out is the Clarno formation, that's that little pile of red here. I'm not, you know, you don't have to, you can just basically look at this graph and go, oh, there's some dots at the bottom that are bright red. Well, th those are the Steen's Pillar Tuff. They are low in a rare earth mineral by the name of niobium. On the other side of the coin, though, is the John Day Formation, or the Tuff of Smith Rock, is actually higher in niobium. So there's a geochemistry, a signature that can tell you what you're seeing. So you take samples and that helps you map the outflow of these, of these tufts because they do literally overlap and, and finger in and you're looking at the same tuft and you're going, uh, which one is it? And that's how you can tell them apart. They actually have a chemical signature. Moving up in time, we're now coming into the John Day Formation 36 to 25 million years ago. Temperate climate, it is moving from tropical to temperate. It's, it's a lot more like you might find in the Willamette Valley. It's a very moist type of climate, but not the semi-arid that we have, or the arids that we have here on this side of the Cascades. We're lucky because we also can drive to a place called the Painted Hills where you can see the climate change and you could see what's going on with tropical to temperate. And, 
and look at these ancient soils called paleosols. The bright red indicates a tropical climate. For those of you that have been to Georgia, you know those deep red soils that you see in Georgia? Well, that's the type of soils that these are. You can, they're basically rusted in place. They're rusting out. And then the, the gold soils or the beige, depending on what time of day, but uh, those are actually the temperate soils. And you can see that this climate change didn't just turn a switch, it vacillated back and forth between tropical and temperate, tropical and temperate, finally landing at temperate. But it took a while. It wasn't something that happened overnight. It was a gradual change. And it was in that time frame, 29 and a half million years ago, that the Crooked River caldera erupted. Big major feature. It was just, it, yes, it is a super volcano. And yes, it was fueled by what we now know is the Yellowstone hotspot that's underneath Yellowstone today. Ray Wells, I'm gonna gotta get my information right here because literally this is just hot off the press. Ray Wells in 2014 with some others was mapping the Sluts River volcanics, which are one of those accreted terrains last to come into the North American plate. And at that point in time, they figured that the Yellowstone hotspot had fueled the Sluts River volcanics. Actually, they have done additional information and on the 7th of January this year, they have done additional data calculations and they have figured out that the Yellowstone hotspot has a deep mantle plume origin. That's just meaning that Instead of being something in, in the upper surface, it's actually something that's coming up from the mantle up through into the plate. So it's, it's a really deep feature. More to come. And that's the fun thing about geology is we keep learning more and more about these volcanoes because when Jason and Mark were mapping, eh, they were trying to figure out what is What's fueling this volcano? And they had some ideas and they thought it might be the Yellowstone hotspot, but it took another nine years before Ray Wells came up with the Slut River Volcanics to today with an additional information. So geology, the story is continually changing. And that's the fun part about rocks. Rocks are rocks, but they tell great stories. So yes, we had this super volcano that went off, super caldera, Crooked River caldera, 29 and a half million years ago. What's the evidence? Well, Mark and Jason spent the, those two years plus more mapping here in Central Oregon. And here's some of the evidence that they found that pointed to the caldera eruption. They found the same thing for Wildcat Mountain but with the Crooked River Caldera, a bigger feature, they were looking at bigger evidence. Peter Skeen Ogden Wayside is a cool little wayside on 97, just north of Terrebonne on your way to Madras. Next time you're on a road trip, stop at Peter Skeen Ogden Wayside and walk out on the old highway bridge because now you can safely walk out there and look to the east and literally see these older rocks tipping to the southeast. And if you go down to the, the uh, day boat launch at Prineville Reservoir, the older rocks, the older andesites are tipping back to the northwest. So there's two big pieces of evidence that here's these rocks that were flat lying that are now poof, tipping to the interior. There's more evidence though. One of the things that they found was they found breccia. And breccia is where when you have rocks rubbing up, up against each other and faults being generated, it fractures up the rocks on a microscopic level. And that's what we're looking at here in this lower right image. But the best evidence they found was the actual caldera wall. 
they were on private land. So it means that the rest of us can't go there, but thank heavens, the landowner was open to letting them explore and get onto their property. And this is what they found. Jason McClary is well over six foot tall. And here he is standing on the older andesites looking at the tufts of Smith Rock. Literally, this is the material that came out of that eruption, slapped up against this older rock. And literally, you're looking at the caldera wall. Well, as I said about the tufts and these caldera features, they all look alike. The tuff looks alike. It's just knowing that geochemistry that identifies it, whether it's the tuff of Smith Rock or or Steen's Pillar, or in this case, Leslie Gulch Tuff of a 15 million year old caldera, Mahogany Mountain that's over near off the Owyhee River. These all look the same, but they're basically quite a bit different in age. For those that like to hike, if you have been up on Misery Ridge and looked off to the east, now you will know that you're looking clear across the Crooked River Caldera next time you hike up there. Here is, is Powell Butte and here's Little Pilot Butte and we're literally looking clear across the caldera. We also had hot springs. Can you imagine hot springs here in Central Oregon? Wouldn't that be nice? We got to go all the way down to Burns and out on the Alvord Playa to get to hot springs or over on the other side of the Cascades. Well, what we have here are hydrothermal deposits that tell us that we had hot springs on the north side of the Crooked River Caldera. And where can we go today to see these same types of features? You got it, Yellowstone. We can go to Yellowstone and see these, these, these um, centers and the geysers, and we can see these hot pots of boiling water. Well, this is what it would have looked like on the north side of the Crooked River Caldera 29 and a half million years ago. Wouldn't that have been amazing to actually see these features here in Central Oregon? And if you go to the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River, that's literally cutting its way through these really soft, very young tufts. And that's the sort of feature that we would have had here in Central Oregon as, as the rivers and the ground and the surface flows were eroding down through these soft materials. So it, kind of imagine, think about what we see today and what it must have looked like several million years ago, actually 20, 15, 20 million years ago. Geologists, as I started this story, the reason Jason and Mark were asked to map here is to figure out our groundwater story. And in the, geologists like to make these pretty colorful maps but one of the things that they do with these maps is they draw a cross section. So you have here A to A prime. And what that cross section does is think about flat landscape and then you foop, slice down it like it's a layer cake. And you look to see what are, those, what are those rocks looking like through that slice. And this is what that A to A prime slice looks like. This is the cross section. So in answer to that groundwater question, they found out that the regional groundwater table is coming out of the Cascades, bless their hearts, they've got wonderful snowpack that is contributing to the groundwater that we get here in central, in central Oregon, mainly along the Deschutes River and coming into the Crooked River. But if you look at what happens on the other side of that caldera margin, there's not a whole lot of groundwater coming in. So that answered a lot of the questions for Prineville about what our water source was going to be. And thank heavens, we have groundwater coming through the Prineville basalts. And that's what was drilled through up near the airport to actually get better groundwater for the, the town of Prineville. 
How many of you have had Opal Springs water? You're getting water straight out of the Cascades. That is water that is coming through these Deschutes Formation, Younger Volcanics, and they're coming, they're coming springing right out of the, the wall at Peter Skeen Ogden Wayside. So after you turn to look east on that bridge, turn and look west and look at those black walls of basalt and you'll see springs coming out of them and water dripping down over the side. That's where the Crooked River becomes a gaining reach where it's been a losing reach prior to that. So now you've got this wonderful groundwater source coming in. And for those of you that might be interested, there's a document called the Upper Deschutes Groundwater Study that this information also played into. And uh, we'll talk about it later as a reference and it is available at the Deschutes Public Library. But that gives you the whole story of the ground, the geology picture for the groundwater situation along the Deschutes River. But we haven't ended geologic time. It didn't stop 29 and a half million years ago. 15 to 16 million years ago, semi-arid climate emerging, thick Columbia River basalts were pouring out across the Pacific Northwest. And we had our own fair of basalts that came in and capped the Ochoco Mountains. This is what that, that big brown blob on this image is showing the extent of these Columbia River basalts. They're stretching from down here in the Steens all the way through. Here's the Picture Gorge basalts with the Monument Dyke Swarm all the way up into Washington. And some of these flows work their way all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. You can see them out there at Newport, that lovely little uh, rock promontory at Newport is Columbia River basalts very thin, runny material, 35 miles an hour, ripping all over everywhere. This is one of those, one of those stories that I think is kind of fun. And, and if you are driving through Picture Gorge, which is near between Dayville and Kimberley Spray, uh, Mitchell, Mitchell to, to Dayville, not the driver. This, you gotta be, you gotta be a passenger for this one. Look at the anatomy of these basalt flows. They are so cool because you can tell the top of a flow from the bottom of a flow. A basalt flow is molten material and it cools quickly into the air and it cools slowly into the soil. And as it's cooling slowly into the soil, these columns start growing. That's called a colonnade. And the upper part of a basalt flow is called an entablature. And it's really small, itty bitty little columns and they're really hackly in nature. And on the very tippy top of a basalt flow is a material that looks like this. It looks like black Swiss cheese. That's vesicular basalt. And you can find that all over our, our volcanic terrain. You can usually find these little Swiss cheesy looking rocks. And that's literally froth on the top of the basalt flow. And when you drive up 97, up Cow Canyon, headed north, or you get up into the gorge, you see these same big, huge columns with these entablatures on top. And the direction of the columns is pointed to the direction of cooling. So take a look at that. Sometimes they're not vertical. From 16 to 3 million years ago, we also had more volcanic eruptions and that served to cover up the Crooked River Caldera, which is why it was such an amazing thing that Mark and Jason found this feature because it's had all these other rocks that have poured in and covered it up. And this is where we had Prineville Basalt, the Syntustis Formation, the Deschutes Formation. These are all different volcanic material coming in from volcanoes to the south and to, to the west coming into this part of Central Oregon. If you drive into Prineville, there's a cool little viewpoint that overlooks town. 
first time I drove, drove to Prineville, I looked across, went up to the viewpoint and I looked across at all of these plateaus. And I thought, oh, so we must have had one basalt flow that came in and literally just covered up the valley floor at that point in time. No, after Jason and Mark got done age dating these basalt flows, turns out they're a variety of different ages, which actually tells us that the Crooked River has been pretty much in the same place for over 15 million years. And it took breaking through those thin basalt caps and into the softer erodible gravels that are underneath to lower the valley floor. So literally, Prineville is an inverted topography. We're looking up at that older valley floor. And some of those materials that were coming in are these ash and ash flow tufts that you can see at Cove Palisade State Park. And this is the ship at the Cove Palisade State Park. These are ash-laden sands that are easily eroded. So if you think about canyon walls and you've got resistant material up top, but once you slice down, the, the river sliced down through that rigid basalt, it just rips through these softer materials and excavates out these really deep canyons, which is what we're looking at here at Cove Palisade State Park. We've got the Crooked River arm coming in on the east and the Deschutes arm coming in on the west. And what's left in the middle right now is this island, which is a nat national natural landmark. That's a park service designation. The island is actually managed by the Bureau of Land Management the Crooked River National Grassland and Oregon State Park. And one of the cool things about this island, if you get an opportunity and get invited up, and I've been up there to pull Medusa heads. So there's, there's ways you can get up there, but you have to have permission to do that. When you get up there, you see these columns up there and they're literally gravity's taking hold and they're starting to separate and fall away. And you could see this big huge landslide where a chunk of that island has already collapsed. So if you're in a boat at Cove Palisades and you're looking up at those big rocks, be aware they're not there forever. They literally are calving off and falling off the edge. That island, it'll be a while, will eventually disappear. Well, the nature of this type of rock. This is the basalt of the island is one million year old basalt that came out of from the direction of, of Newberry. It's not a Newberry basalt, but it's coming from the south, coming down the ancestral Crooked River and the Deschutes River. So it literally filled up, almost filled up the canyon, not quite. And more flows, basalt flows have come down. This is actually in the last 2 million years to 11,000 years ago. This is the Newberry flow. 400,000 year old Newberry flow came from 40 miles away at Newberry, came ripping down across the landscape, fell over at O'Neill Junction, dropped into the Crooked River drainage, slammed up against what's now Smith Rock State Park and those tufts, ripped its way around the corner and on down toward what's now Lake Billy Chinook. These basalt flows were rip roaring along. Think about any flood that you might have been around. That's what these basalt flows were doing. Pretty runny and fast moving material. And they were caught up in the canyon, so they couldn't splash up out of the canyon. They were literally racing down through the canyon. And how do we know that's what was going on? Well, if you've ever parked at Smith Rock State Park, you have parked on that 400,000 year old basalt flow from Newberry and then hiked down into the canyon. And what we're looking at here is the fact that this basalt flow came in, dammed up the Crooked River, and the Crooked River said, fine, I will find a way around. And what it did, it literally cut its way around through the soft tufts around the edge of the basalt flow. When you hike down into Smith Rock State Park next time, Take a look as you get down below that black rock and take a look at what that black rock is sitting on. I'll bet you find evidence of 
river bottom. And what would, might that be? Round cobbles. Look for round cobbles. It's pretty cool when you get down through there because the next time you find round cobbles after you leave here is down here on the Crooked River where it's excavated to. It's kind of a fun feature to look at because you can see where this basalt flow, these intracanyon flows have flowed in through the channel of the ancestral Crooked River and the same thing happened with the Deschutes River. This is also the time when our large volcanoes started erupting over the last two million years. And we're well up now on the timeline, getting right up almost to the top of the Empire State Building. Mount Jefferson, Mount Hood, Mount Mazama. This was all of our big volcanoes were starting to grow and build up. And volcanoes, if you add 15,000, 18,000 years ago, we had alpine glaciation. These volcanoes don't stand up well to glacial ice. They lost a thousand foot roughly off the tops of, of the volcanoes. So if you think about what they look like today, and we think they're pretty impressive and they're really, really cool mountains. They used to be a lot taller, huge volcanoes. So it kind of gives you a different impression when you walk around the corner and, and drive down the highway 97 and take a look at those cascades now, because you can see them from the Willamette Valley. You can see them from, from the east side as well. And they're beautiful peaks, but think if they were a thousand foot taller, beautiful mountains. The last 11,000 years to present, we have still had volcanic activity. How many of you remember Mount St. Helens, May 18th, 1980 eruption? This was the view out my kitchen window. It was ash falling out of the sky and had a strong sulfur smell. It was eerie, it was quiet. It was, we didn't know what was gonna happen. That was one cubic kilometer of ash fall and it extended clear across, it rolled its way Montana, parts east because that was where the prevailing winds took it. Well, 7,700 years ago, Mount Mazama erupted 100 cubic kilometers of ash. Now the heavy stuff, the pumice, if you Go down south on 97 toward Lapine. That's where you find pumice soils and they're really cool soils, but they're pumice fragments. Now there are other volcanoes that have also erupted ash and pumice, but for our area, the biggest eruption has pretty much been Mount Mazama. It left, in the prevailing winds, it left a foot of hat foot and a half of fine volcanic ash capping the Ochico Mountains. And that's one of the things that's left that added to the soil component to where it made it a lot, uh, it improved the soil conditions. So a lot more timber can grow, vegetation can grow. It basically was a soil additive. Who knew? I think the farmers up in, up in Ritzville and Eastern Washington figured it out several years later about some of the changes that happened with just the thin ash fall of Mount St. Helens. But Mount Mazama really added to our soil horizon with the fallout and then how the wind swept it off on the leeward side of the slopes. So thank heavens for volcanic activity. So here we are with Oregon Super Caldera. This is one of the, this is an opportunity to get to know your area. And there's a lot of cool references that if you like to explore and Central Oregon. And if you're looking for a quick little road trip, you could literally drive the perimeter of the caldera by going to Prineville Reservoir to Peters Keen Ogden Wayside, drive up to Ochico Wayside, and then go out to Smith Rock. And that gives you an opportunity to drive the whole perimeter of this caldera. 
If you want to read up a little bit further and get some field guides, the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, Dog Amy, has a wealth of information. Roadside, Marley Miller's new roadside guide to Oregon of Oregon is Roadside Geology of Oregon is fantastic. It is a wonderful book. Mine's getting kind of dog-eared now, but it's one of those books that really lays out all of our geology across the state. And she does actually talk about the Crooked River Caldera in this. Another good book is In Search of Ancient Oregon. If you like picture books, Ellen Morris Bishop's Bishops in Search of Ancient Oregon is well worth checking out. And the fun part is, is The Geology of Oregon by Bill Ward. These are all available at our public libraries. So feel free, check them out. In fact, that Upper Deschutes Base and Groundwater Study completed by the Oregon Department of Resources is also available at the Deschutes Public Library. Laurel has put together a, oh, I just spaced on, um, she's put together a catalog list of, the, thank you, Laurel. <laughs> she's put together a catalog list of these different references and posted it on, the, on my uh, talk on the library website. So feel free. And I added another book. I didn't talk to Laurel about it, but if you are really fascinated with stories in stone, David Williams has written this awesome book that talks about all of those interesting buildings that you might've traveled past or walked next to the brownstones. Uh, here in Central Oregon, we sometimes see facing on rock that looks on buildings that looks different from anything that we normally see around here. Well, he's gone into great detail to talk about where some of those rocks come from. I just think that our geology is telling us some incredible stories. And I urge you to go explore your area and where you live because Wherever you are, there's so much to see and learn. So I have a quiz for you. Can anybody name that shadow that is on the right side of the image? Does anybody know what that shadow is? If somebody local knows that that's Pilot Butte, you're right. Next time you walk up Pilot Butte, I know a lot of us will hike up and we'll race around the corner because we want to look at our pretty volcanoes on the crest of the Cascades. The majority of the view shed that you're hiking past is the 29 and a half million year old Crooked River Caldera. So I invite you to savor and think about what would that have looked like when it was erupting? Here's Powell Butte, one of those rhyolite intrusions, to Grizzly Mountain, it's another rhyolite intrusion, to Gray Butte, it's another rhyolite intrusion, to the Tufts of Smith Rock State Park, where a lot of people hang off the rocks and climb on them. So you're looking clear across the Crooked River Caldera in that view shed. This evening, we've talked about living at the apex of four physiographic provinces. We've talked about the geologic history and set the stage for the Wildcat Mountain 40 million year old caldera and the Crooked River caldera 29 and a half million year old caldera. These are big volcanoes compared to our pretty little cascade volcanoes, massive eruptions. We live with geology. And our volcanic past has brought us a wonderfully complex environment. Thank you so much for joining me this evening and exploring our geology here in Central Oregon and here in the Pacific Northwest. I think Thank Laurel's you. gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> stop screen share and Laurel's going to come forward with questions. Yeah, and Carrie, I, I know that I speak for the audience when I say that your enthusiasm is inspiring and it's really wonderful to learn from a presenter who is excited and just <laughs> loves their subject. So we got a lot of thank yous 
Um, <laughs> Wonderful. For, just for your whole attitude and how you feel about this. So um, I you. do have, you have a lot of questions here. <laughs> so first off, uh, what is granitics? What is a granitic rock? Oh my gosh. Okay. We're taught base, base. And I wouldn't, you know, it. I did not bring a granite. I usually have a variety of rocks with me. So granitics and granites are the slow cooling. They're, they're the name for them is plutonic, but they're the slower cool, uh, chilling rock at depth. So it has time for those crystal, those minerals that make up the volcanic rock that chills so darn quickly that here you see holes, but what you don't see is the individual minerals that make up this rock. If I had a piece of granite, you would actually see those minerals. So it's a rock that cools at depth. Okay, wonderful. And is Fort Rock a caldera? No, it's a different type of volcano. It's it's um it's a tough ring. And what's kind of, and I didn't go into all the other features that show above the Earth's surface, but a, a tough ring is literally a volcano that comes up through a lake. So mm -hmm. you end up with with uh, a very explosive eruption. Uh, is the tuff in the sheep rock unit that's of the John Day fossil beds uh, that makes is that what makes it all red, green and red? Oh, what makes it green and red? The tufts that, like the, this green one that I showed? Okay, so this was kind of a fun thing I learned about. It's the, it's a clay alteration mineral called seladonite, C-E-L-A-D-O-N-I-T-E, -E, seladonite. And it literally is just an alteration mineral that happens after the fact. You could also get iron oxide to where you end up with, with a tuff that turns red. Now that's not to be confused with rhyolite, because mm -hmm. rhyolite is literally the lava that is uh, also that same type of chemistry. It's, it's a silica rich rock, but it's, it's another lava flow type of rock. How large are the limestone pieces that you see at Smith Rock and have <laughs> they been dated as Permian? I don't remember the dates on them. You'll have to go to the field report that Jason and Mark put out and, and it might be Permian, I don't remember. But the pieces are literally this size and smaller. So you're talking two inch to one inch fragments. They're not, but the funny thing was, is apparently there was a pocket enough that when a, a mapper went through there in the six days, they said, ah, limestone. And they drew a polygon around it. And I got into the middle of Smith Rock and I'm looking, well, this is all tough around here, but where's this limestone? Well, then we found out that it was because it was coming up from at depth. Mm. Are there any active calderas in the world today? <laughs> yeah, Yellowstone. <laughs> Cross your fingers that in our lifetime, we don't actually experience an eruption because it will uh, change our life significantly. Mm. Uh, so yeah, there and there are other active calderas as well around the Earth's surface, but our closest one is Yellowstone. So if you wanna go see geysers and hot springs and get a feel for something that's fairly young. I gotta admit, when I visited with my family, it's been a number of years ago and we drove across, we drove across the Yellowstone. I kept thinking, magma, not too low. It's not too far beneath my feet. Oh my, oh my. So if it erupts, <laughs> that's okay. I'm with my family. We'll all go together. Yeah. So it was, it was one of those trips that I was very conscious as a geologist of mm. what that ground and that story that geologic history was telling us. Which is a lot more than the tourists that walk off the boardwalk think about when they do that. So good job, Carrie. Is the Crooked River Caldera what is described on the information boards at the Prineville Wetlands Complex? Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, and that was one that I had an opportunity to work with the, the graphic artists and with, with our, uh, our water department here in town to put together that 
that board. And it's not up yet, but the kids, the elementary kids at Barnes Feud, uh, they, I went in and talked to them and they came up with their own version of, of the, the area and talking about the geology with Barnes Butte and the Crooked River. So eventually that hopefully that interpretive sign and set of signs will eventually show up at Barnes Butte Park. But yes, that's exactly what's being talked about at the wetlands. Oh, very cool. Uh, how long does it take soft tough like what you see at Big Bend National Park into a rock that is hard enough for rock climbing that we see at Smith Rock? One of the things about tough is that you uh, there's different levels of cementation that happens with these silicic rocks and like the tough. And there are places where you can go that you can look at tough and literally take a rock hammer or a pick and slice down through it. It's so friable. You could carve out uh, a, a cave out of it with, with some really strong effort. The tufts actually, it's not gonna change over time so much as the softer material is gonna get worn away. So that being said, when you look at the tuff that is now being climbed on at Smith Rock, that is actually had 29 and a half million years of erosion and the Crooked River ripping away at sides of that, because if you know where the where the elevation of the, the Newberry flow comes in, all of that material that is opposite that against the, the cliffs there on, on the other side of the river has been worn back to where it's really resistant material. All of the soft stuff the river cut down through and said, hey, that basalt's too hard. I'm gonna go for that soft stuff first. So uh, there's not really a time frame that's gonna cement it so much as where it is within the deposit and how well it's cemented. So if you drive up while, uh, Mill Creek and look at Steen's Pillar, that was literally, and, and this also happened in around Smith Rock, you had, uh, jets of steam that came up through the tough and case hardened zones. And that's what literally is poking up there. That's, that's um, Steen's pillar and all the other pillars along the skyline are those erosional remnants that were resistant to initial erosion. Now they eventually will erode, but from a softer standpoint, the soft stuff's all gone. Mm. It's all somewhere out there off the coast of Astoria. Okay. <laughs> so on our coastline, there is, let's see here. Um, let us know if you'll, if, if, you, if you guys saw in the, I had some questions about like some of the resources and I'll see if I can post it again. So that I say, I shared it again. And that link is to the list of resources that Carrie mentioned. Uh, that's connected to Deschutes Public Library, which is also connected to Kirk County Library. And that will be emailed out to uh, all registrants, people who didn't attend, people who um, registered and your email saved with us. And uh, a link to the recording will also be sent out. So just getting that out for everyone who's here. Um, why is there a band of red and monkey faced while the rest is tan? <laughs> I love it getting geologists in here. It's like, why? <laughs> well, I think part of that with, with monkey face is, is that same alteration that goes on. And, and I know you can't see my, my sample here really that, that well, but pumice or the pumice and the ash that make up these tough rocks, they're porous rocks. So think of them as being able to transmit water to a certain degree. So they're literally going to, uh, depending on the iron content in the rocks, they may rest in place. And so I, I haven't looked closely at that red band. I've noticed it, I've got pictures of it, but it literally is probably iron oxide and rusting going on in place. Mm. And that's, so that's the cool thing about all of that groundwater that I was showing coming in from the Cascades, because it's coming through a lot of those 
those more porous rocks and the porous zones be between the basalt flows. So that's, that's the advantage that we have with, with all of those young volcanics coming out of the Cascades is they still are porous. They haven't filled in. So they're, they're moving groundwater. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, which we need here. So which we need here. <laughs> we really do. What a question. Um, this person saying, I've listened to previous talks about geology, but your talk is leaving me on shaky ground. Literally, correct me if I completely am misunderstood, but I'm coming away with a sense that this land that feels so stable under my feet is anything but that the land we depend on and take for granted is moving in multiple directions, sinking, floating, rotating, erupting. <laughs> yes, it <laughs> is. People's world, Gary. <laughs> but it's, it's moving on a geologic time frame. So we're fortunate here in Central Oregon not to be anywhere near that subduction zone earthquake area. And if you look at, this is why Dog Ami website is so cool, because if you look at the Dog Ami website, it actually shows the shaking potential for areas and we're going to be pretty darn stable. We're, uh, but yes, that's the, that is part of the takeaway is to recognize that our landscape is dynamic. It could be landslides that I think we're probably going to be seeing coming, coming down those slopes where we had the fires this last fall on, on the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got big, huge landslides here in Central Oregon cascading down off the Ochico Mountains. So it's, we have the geologic instability, but it's not it's not the high risk or anything to be fearful of. It's just to recognize that, oh, so in a slow fashion, our land form is twisting clockwise, okay, and that makes these rumpled black basalt rocks that should be rigid, that rumples them up to the north of us here. That's all part of the geologic story, mm. and it's, it's part of us. It's okay. Oh, one thing I do want to share, though, and I was talking to Laurel about this just before we, we uh, started the program, that geochemistry that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So the, there is a musical artist, Karen Patridge, that's coming, oh, I wrote down the date, uh, the 27th of January. Mm -hmm. She is the geochemist that did the work for this study. But she has another life. She is a musician. So I hope you can go hear her later in the month because yeah, it's really a cool. Virtual, a virtual presentation for Deschutes Public Library. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel and in our uh, Deschutes Library calendar. So I we had no idea. I knew she was a geologist. She's a Portland-based person, but I had no idea she was part of the research that Carrie talked about tonight. <laughs> so the geological world is... It's a very small <laughs> world. <laughs> Carrie, we have more questions. I'll try to go through That's them fine. here. Um, is Mount Pisgah, P-I-S-G-A-A, oh. part of the Columbia River basalt? It is. It is underlain by the picture gorge basalts that I was talking about that, uh, because yeah, Pisgah and Spanish Peak both are, are picture gorge basalt and some of that picture gorge basalt, the vents for those are near the town of Monument and literally they wrapped up around what's now Big Summit Prairie, which there's another short story about the prairie, is that's underlain by the John Day formation. So if you think about those soft hills that we see driving out to Post Polina or going to the Painted Hills, we probably had a mound of those that these molten basalt flows came around and basically stopped. Mm -hmm. So that's what is capping Pisgah. Now, the north side of Pisgah literally has fallen off, that slide mountain. That's a big, huge landslide with those heavy basalts sliding on those Clarno, the Clarno formation that's underneath there. It's not so much John Day's Clarno, but that, that's what's gone on there. But yes, Pisgah is capped by picture gorge basalt, which is one of the older Columbia River basalts. Okay. And is Sim Tustus what you see when you drive through Warm Springs? 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, where did the basalt flows come from that you showed in that picture of Prineville that are a few million years apart? I thought they all came from Newberry. Ah, no. Okay, so I didn't go into detail on that because it really kind of takes kind of You're covering millions of years, Carrie. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it, you know, it's three, <laughs> it's three to five million years time frame here on these, but literally they came from Stearns Butte, which is just right outside of Prineville to the, to the south. It came from Myers Butte, the five million year old flow that, that the viewpoint is on and is the flow, uh, the flow top, I think that, uh, um, Apple, I think, yeah, Apple, because Facebook's back behind the viewpoint that Apple sits on, came out of Myers Butte, which is a small volcano as you're headed toward Redmond. They all came from local vents. And that was the fun part of what Jason and Mark were mapping is the fact that we had all these little small volcanoes that were spewing out these basalt flows right and left. And then and the Combs Flat, that's also another one that was coming from a source a little bit further east that was coming out and coalesced into the valley floor that was at that time. So no, these are not Newberry flows. These are literally coming from very local vents. Okay, I'm going through all the thank yous. So you're gonna have to check those out. <laughs> um, let's see here. Is there a sinkhole? Yeah, synclinal fold at the reservoir where you talked about the rock angle, the rock layers angled in two directions, or is that anti? Anticline. Synclinal yeah. anticline. Okay. Yeah. And, and are they talking about? Okay. So what's going on at? If they're talking about what's going on at Prineville Reservoir at the boat launch, the day use boat launch, literally. That's actually a not so much a casual anticline or a syncline, which is indicating a fold. It literally is a collapse. So you've got rocks that were level and then literally they're breaking and collapsing into the interior. So it's not technically an, um, I suppose you could call it a monocline, you know, the fact that they're dropping in, but it's, uh, we do have anticlines coming and um, anticlines coming off of the, the picture gorge basalt, but these features for the caldera are literally collapse features. It literally is things that just tip to the interior. So it's not, not the more casual anticlines and synclines that you see related to the fabric or the tectonic structure of the rocks. Okay. Did the Crooked River caldera erupt at a lower latitude and eventually get transported north by clockwise rotation? Okay, I'm glad I didn't understand that question. So I'm glad that you... you got it. And we did not, that's exactly what happened. And we okay. did not know that until this last 10 to 15 years with this clockwise rotation. And with the Sluts River volcanic work that Ray Wells did in 2014, literally now what the theory is, and this is the thing about geology, but the current thought is that you backtrack that all that rotation and it puts our area further south and in line with some of the, the hotspot um, movement. But it's still theory and concept. So that's kind of the thought right now is that when this actually erupted, it was it was further south and it's now moved into where we are today as part of this moving on this long-term clockwise rotation. Mm. So Laurel, you did fine reading that. <laughs> I'm reading someone else's really smart question. <laughs> Uh, I'll read a couple more here. Speaking of the altered rocks, can you elucidate the mineral content of the varied colors of the painted dunes? Uh, pretty, um, I'd 
be pretty rough on that. What, what I do know is that with, the, with laterite soils that you get in tropical climates, you get a high iron oxide content, literally the rock, the soils are resting in place, so to speak. And so that is what is creating the red. I don't know what would be, you might have limonite or uh, other types of iron oxide minerals that might be contributing to some of the warmer tones in the temperate soils. Mm -hmm. But this would be a question for Greg Retallick or some of the other uh, geologists that have literally done the detailed mapping of these soils. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So let's see, you got your research there for you. Go, yeah. go to Dagami. All of these reports are available at the Department of Oregon Geology and Mineral Industry. And Dagami is one of the resources in that list yes. that we shared. It, it starts with Biblio Commons and it will be sent out to all uh, registrants later on. You have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> hey, Carrie, <laughs> I, I, people are loving this. Um, I'll ask one more. And it did the study that you mentioned about the groundwater, did it change the interpretation of groundwater flow in Central Oregon? What it did is it confirmed that there was, a, there've been a series of groundwater studies that have been done over the decades. And when I first got here to Central Oregon, the one study I could lay my hands on was written in the 1960s. And at that point in time, it said volcanic rocks, very low potential for great quantities of groundwater, especially from the Crooked River to parts east. And what the geologic mapping did, and this is one of those things where if you really want to get into writing some letters right now, the State legislature is seriously looking at uh, dismantling Dogami. And by doing that and parsing out a few positions to other areas, they're not gonna be as, as able to do the, the strong mapping that we as public citizens need to answer our questions. So to answer your question about the groundwater study, yes, the maps that Mark Ferns did in the Steelhead Falls area and uh, some of the work that's been done on the crest of the Cascades, they all contributed to this greater picture that Marshall Gannett, who was the, the hydrologist, uh, uh, groundwater geologist, hydrologist with with USGS and working with, with the Oregon Water, Water Resources Department, they determined flow characteristics through the volcanics based on the detailed mapping that's been done in the last 30 years. So if we hadn't had that information, no, we would not have been able to come together with the type of information we now know about groundwater transport between Lapine to Bend to, to Madras and on down through the Deschutes. So, and it also answered the question that Prineville is gonna to have to really look hard for groundwater because you're not gonna drill the dry holes that were drilled right here in Prineville proper and get any groundwater for a community. So yes, it did change how groundwater was interpreted. Mm. Geology is amazing. It, and it's kind it, of important. <laughs> it, it has these important aspects to our civil life and water. But then also, I am so excited to go to Smith Rock and stand at Misery Ridge and look at the rim of the caldera. I'm really excited about that. So thank you, Carrie, for your enthusiasm this evening and sharing uh, with all of us who you know, are geology, geology newbies and for people who really know what they're talking about. Um, it's been a real pleasure. I do want to thank you all in the audience for joining us tonight. Um, it's, it's been a good night. Uh, the Shoes Public Library has many wonderful programs that are all fun, free, and virtual. Another program you might be interested in is the day after tomorrow, this Thursday, it's uh, Botany Meets Biology, The Plight of the Sage Grouse uh, by our local East Audubon Society uh, 
who is it, President Stu Garrett. Stu Garrett. Oh, yeah. He's awesome. And you can find that in many other programs on our event calendar or at our, cal yeah, DeschutesLibrary.org forward slash calendar. And recordings of many of these programs are available, are also available on our YouTube channel. So please check that out. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. I know there are a lot more questions to ask. Uh, of Carrie, and obviously we have to have you again in a field trip later when <laughs> this pandemic is over because I have a feeling we're going <laughs> to cap out at like 200 people. So this has been wonderful. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening out there and field trip, field trip. <laughs> <laughs> have a great night, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. And it's been a pleasure talking with you.